Chapter Seven of The Guest of Quesnay by Booth Tarkington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Berard. Chapter Seven. The cat that fell from the top of the Washington Monument and scampered off unhurt was killed by a dog at the next corner. Thus, a certain painter man winged with canvases and easel might have been seen to depart hurriedly from a poppy-sprinkled field an infuriated norman stallion in close attendance and to fly safely over a stone wall of good height only to turn his ankle upon an unconsidered pebble some ten paces farther on the nose of the stallion projected over the wall snorting joy thereat the ankle was one which had turned aforetime it was an old weakness moreover it was mine i was the painter man i could count on little less than a week of idleness within the confines of les trois pigeons and reclining among cushions in a wicker long chair looking out from my pavilion upon the drowsy garden on a hot noontide i did not much care it was cooler indoors comfortable enough the open door framed the courtyard where pigeons were strutting on the gravel walks between flower beds beyond and thrown deeper into the perspective by the outer frame of the great archway road and fields and forest fringes were revealed lying tremulously in the hot sunshine the foreground gained a human though not lively interest from the ample figure of our maitre d'hotel reposing in a rustic chair which had enjoyed the shade of an arbor about an hour earlier when first occupied but now stood in the broiling sun at times amadie's upper eyelids lifted as much as the sixteenth of an inch and he made a hazy gesture as if to wave the sun away or when the tablecloth upon his left arm slid slowly earthward he adjusted it with a petulant jerk without material interruption to his siesta meanwhile glouglou rolling and smoking cigarettes in the shade of a clump of lilac watched with button eyes the noddings of his superior and at the cost of some convulsive writhings constrained himself to silent laughter a heavy step crunched the gravel and i heard my name pronounced in a deep inquiring rumble the voice of professor keredec no less nor was i greatly surprised since our meeting in the forest had led me to expect some advances on his part toward friendliness or at least in the direction of a better acquaintance however i withheld my reply for a moment to make sure i had heard aright the name was repeated here i am i called in the pavilion if you wish to see me aha i hear you've become an invalid my dear sir with that the professor's great bulk loomed in the doorway against the glare outside i have come to condole with you if you allow it to smoke with me too i hope i said not a little pleased that i will do he returned and came in slowly walking with perceptible lameness the sympathy i offer is genuine it is not only from the heart it is from the latissimus dorsa he continued seating himself with a cavernous groan i am your confrere in illness my dear sir i have choosed this fine weather for rheumatism of the back i hope it is not painful ha it is so so he rumbled removing his spectacles and wiping his eyes dazzled by the sun there is more of me than most men more to suffer nature was generous to the little germs when she made this big caradec she offered them room for their campaigns of war you'll take a cigarette i thank you if you do not mind i smoke my pipe he took from his pocket a worn leather case which he opened disclosing a small brown clay bowl of the kind workmen use and fitting it with a red stem he filled it with a dark and sinister tobacco from a pouch always my pipe for me he said and applied a match inhaling the smoke as other men inhaled the light smoke of cigarettes ha it is good it is wicked for the insides but it is good for the soul and clouds wreathed his great beard like a storm on mont blanc as he concluded with gusto it is my first pipe since yesterday that is being a good smoker i ventured sententiously 
to wet indulgence with abstinence my dear sir he protested i am a man without even enough virtue to be an epicure when i am alone i am a chimney with no hebdomadary response i smoke forever it is on account of my young friend i am temperate now he has never smoked your young friend i asked glancing at my visitor rather curiously i fear mr saffron has no vices professor keredec replaced his silver-rimmed spectacles and turned them upon me with serene benevolence he is in good condition all pure like little children and so if i smoke near him he chokes and has water at the eyes though he does not complain just now i take a vacation it is his hour for study but i think he looks more out of the front window than at his book he looks very much from the window there was a muttering of subterranean thunder somewhere which i was able to locate in the professor's torso and took to be his expression of a chuckle yes very much since the passing of that charming lady some days ago you say your young friend's name is saffron oliver saffron the benevolent gaze continued to rest upon me but a shadow like a faint anxiety darkened the homeric brow and an odd notion entered my mind without any good reason that professor keredec was wondering what i thought of the name i uttered some commonplace syllable of no moment and there ensued a pause during which the seeming shadow upon my visitor's forehead became a reality deepening to a look of perplexity and trouble finally he said abruptly it is about him that i have come to talk to you i shall be very glad i murmured but he brushed the callow formality aside with a gesture of remonstrance ha my dear sir he cried but you are a man of feeling we are both old enough to deal with more than just these little words of the mouth it was the way you have received my poor young gentleman's excuses when he was so rude which makes me wish to talk with you on such a subject it is why i would not have you believe mr saffron and me two very suspected individuals who hide here like two bad criminals no no i protested hastily the name of professor keredec the name of no man he thundered interrupting can protect his reputation when he is caught peeping from a curtain ha my dear sir i know what you think you think he is a nice fine man that old professor oh very nice only he hides behind the curtain sometimes very fine man oh yes only he is a spy eh ha <laughs> ha that is what you have been thinking my dear sir not at all i laughed i thought you might fear that i was a spy hey he became sharply serious upon the instant what made you think that i suppose you might be conducting some experiments or perhaps writing a book which you wished to keep from the public for a time and that possibly you might imagine that i was a reporter so and that is all he returned with evident relief no my dear sir i was the spy it is the truth and i was spying upon you i confess my shame i wish very much to know what you were like what kind of a man you are and so he concluded with an opening of the hands palms upward as if to show that nothing remained for concealment and so i have watched you why i asked the explanation is so simple it was necessary because of of mr saffron i said slowly and with some trepidation precisely the professor exhaled a cloud of smoke because i am sensitive for him and because in a certain way i am how should it be said perhaps it is near the truth to say i am his guardian i see forgive me he rejoined quickly but i am afraid you do not see i am not his guardian by the law i had not supposed that you were i said why not because though he puzzled me and i do not understand his case his case so to speak i have not for a moment thought him insane ha my dear sir you are right exclaimed keredec beaming on me much pleased you are a thousand times right he is as sane as yourself or myself or as anybody in the whole wide world 
ha he is now much more sane for his mind is not yet confused and becobwebbed with the useless things you and i put into ours it is open and clear like the little children's mind and it is a good mind it is only a little learning a little experience that he lacks a few months more ha at the greatest a year from now and he will not be different any longer he will be like the rest of us only the professor leaned forward and his big fist came down on the arm of his chair he shall be better than the rest of us but if strange people were to see him now he continued leaning back and dropping his voice to a more confidential tone it would not do this poor world is full of fools there are so many who judge quickly if they should see him now they might think he is not just right in his brain and then as it could happen so easily those same people might meet him again after a while ha they would say there was a time when that young man was insane i knew him and so he might go through his life with those clouds over him those clouds are black clouds they can make more harm than our old sins and i wish to save my friend from them so i have brought him here to this quiet place where nobody comes and we can keep from meeting any foolish people but my dear sir he leaned forward again and spoke emphatically it would be barbarous for men of intelligence to live in the same house and go always hiding from one another let us dine together this evening if you will and not only this evening but every evening you are willing to share with us and do not wish to be alone it will be good for us we are three men like hermits far out of the world but a thousand saints let us be civilized to one another with all my heart i said ha i wish you to know my young man keredec went on you will like him no man of feeling could keep himself from liking him and he is your fellow countryman i hope you will be his friend he should make friends for he needs them i think he has a host of them said i in professor keredec my visitor looked at me quizzically for a moment shook his head and sighed that is only one small man in a big body that professor keredec and yet he went on sadly it is all the friends that poor boy has in the world you will dine with us to-night acquiescing cheerfully i added you will join me at the table on my veranda won't you i can hobble that far but not much farther before answering he cast a sidelong glance at the arrangement of things outside the door the screen of honeysuckle ran partly across the front of the little porch about half of which it concealed from the garden and consequently from the road beyond the archway i saw that he took note of this before he pointed to that corner of the veranda most closely screened by the vines and said may the table be placed yonder certainly i often have it there even when i am alone ha huh, that is good he exclaimed it is not human for a frenchman to eat in the house in good weather it is a pity i said that i should have been such a bugbear this remark was thoroughly disingenuous for although i did not doubt that anything he told me was perfectly true nor that he had made as complete a revelation as he thought consistent with his duty toward the young man in his charge i did not believe that his former precautions were altogether due to my presence at the inn and i was certain that while he might fear for his friend some chance repute of insanity he had greater terrors than that as to their nature i had no clue nor was it my affair to be guessing but whatever they were the days of security at les trois pigeons had somewhat eased professor keredec's mind in regard to them at least his anxiety was sufficiently assuaged to risk dining out of doors with only my screen of honeysuckle between his charge and curious eyes so much was evident the reproach is deserved he returned after a pause it is to be wished that all our bugbears might offer as pleasant a revelation if we had the courage or the slyness he laughed to investigate i made a reply of similar gallantry and he got to his feet rubbing his back as he rose 
ha i am old old rheumatism in warm weather that is ugly now i must go to my boy and see what he can make of his given the poor fellow i think he finds the decay of rome worse than rheumatism in summer he replaced his pipe in its case and promising heartily that it should not be the last he would smoke in my company and domain was making slowly for the door when he paused at a sound from the road we heard the rapid hoofbeats of a mettled horse he crossed our vision and the open archway a high stepping hackney going well driven by a lady in a light trap which was half full of wild flowers it was a quick picture like a flash of the cinematograph but the pose of the lady as a driver was seen to be of a commanding grace and though she was not in white but in light blue and her plain sailor hat was certainly not trimmed with roses i had not the least difficulty in recognizing her at the same instant there was a hurried clatter of footsteps upon the stairway leading from the gallery the startled pigeons fluttered up from the garden path betaking themselves to flight and that other monsieur came leaping across the courtyard through the archway and into the road Glugo, look quickly he called loudly in french as he came who is that lady Glugo would have replied but the words were taken out of his mouth amadie awoke with a frantic start and launched himself at the archway caroming from its nearest corner and hurtling onward at a speed which for once did not diminish in proportion to his progress that lady monsieur he gasped checking himself at the young man's side and gazing after the trap that is madame d'armand madame d'armand saffron repeated the name slowly her name is madame d'armand yes monsieur said amedee complacently it is an american lady who has married a french nobleman End of chapter seven chapter eight of the guest of quesnay by booth tarkington this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt Perard chapter eight like most painters i have supposed the tools of my craft harder to manipulate than those of others the use of words particularly seemed readier handier for the contrivance of effects than pigments i thought the language of words less elusive than that of color leaving smaller margin for unintended effects and believing in complacent good faith that words conveyed exact meanings exactly it was my innocent conception that almost anything might be so described in words that all who read must inevitably perceive that thing precisely if this were true there would be little work for the lawyers who produce such tortured pages in the struggle to be definite who swing riches from one family to another save men from violent death or send them to it and earn fortune for themselves through the dangerous inadequacies of words i have learned how great was my mistake and now i am wishing that i could shift paper for canvas that i might paint the young man who came to interest me so deeply i wish i might present him here in color instead of trusting to this unstable business of words so wily and undependable with their shimmering values that you cannot turn your back upon them for two minutes but they will be shouting a hundred things which they were not meant to tell to make the best of necessity what i have written of him my first impressions must be taken as the picture although it be but a gossamer sketch in the air instead of definite work with well-ground pigments to show forth a portrait to make you see flesh and blood it must take the place of something contrived with my own tools to reveal what the following days revealed him to me and what it was about him evasive of description which made me so soon as keredic wished his friend life among our kin and kind is made pleasanter by our daily platitudes who is more tedious than the man incessantly struggling to avoid the banal 
nature rules that such a one will produce nothing better than epigram and paradox saying old old things in a new way or merely shifting object for subject and his wife's face when he shines for a circle is worth a glance with no further apology i declare that i am a person who has felt few positive likes or dislikes for people in this life and i did deeply like my fellow lodgers at les trois pigeons liking for both men increased with acquaintance and for the younger i came to feel in addition a kind of championship doubtless in some measure due to what keredec had told me of him but more to that half humorous sense of protectiveness that we always have for those young people whose untempered and innocent outlook makes us feel as we say a thousand years old the afternoon following our first dinner together the two in returning from their walk came into the pavilion with cheerful greetings instead of going to their rooms as usual and keredec declaring that the open air had dispersed his rheumatism asked if he might overhaul some of my little canvases and boards i explained that they consisted mainly of notes for future use but consented willingly whereupon he arranged a number of them as for exhibition and delivered himself impromptu of the most vehemently instructive lecture on art i had ever heard beginning with the family the tribe and the totem pole he was able to demonstrate a theory that art was not only useful to society but its primary necessity a curious thought probably more attributable to the fact that he was a frenchman than to that of his being a scientist and here he said in the course of his demonstration pointing to a sketch which i had made one morning just after sunrise here you can see real sunshine one certain day there came those few certain moment at the sunrise when the light was like this those few moment where are they they have disappeared gone for eternally they went he snapped his fingers like that yet here they are ha forever but it doesn't look like sunshine said oliver saffron hesitatingly stating a disconcerting but incontrovertible truth it only seems to look like it because isn't it because it's so much brighter than the rest of the picture i doubt if paint can look like sunshine he turned from the sketch caught keredec's gathering frown and his face flushed painfully ah he cried i shouldn't have said it i interposed to reassure him exclaiming that it were a godsend indeed did all our critics merely speak the plain truth as they see it for themselves the professor would not have it so and cut me off no 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 my dear sir he shouted you speak with kindness but you put some wrong ideas in his head saffron's look of trouble deepened i don't understand he murmured i thought you said always to speak the truth just as i see it i have told you keredec declared vehemently nothing of the kind but only yesterday never i understood then you understood only one half i say speak the truth as you see it when you speak i did not tell you to speak how much time have you give to study sunshine and paint what do you know about them nothing answered the other humbly a profound rumbling was heard and the frown disappeared from professor keredec's brow like the vanishing of the shadow of a little cloud from the dome of some great benevolent and scientific institute he dropped a weighty hand on his young friend's shoulder and in high good humour thundered then you are a critic knowing nothing of sunshine except that it warms you and never having touched paint you are going to tell about them to a man who spends his life studying them you look up in the night and the truth you see is that the moon and stars are crossing the ocean you will tell that to the astronomer ha the truth is what the masters see when you know what they see you may speak at dinner the night before it had struck me that saffron was a rather silent young man by habit and now i thought i began to understand the reason i hinted as much saying that would make a quiet world of it all the better my dear sir 
the professor turned beamingly upon me and continued dropping into a whistlerian mannerism that he had sometimes you must not blame that great wind of a Karadek for preaching at other people to listen it gives the poor man poor room for himself to talk i found his talk worth hearing i would show you if i could our pleasant evenings of lingering after coffee behind the tremulous green of honeysuckle with the night very dark and quiet beyond the warm nimbus of our candlelight the faces of my two companions clear obscure in a mellow shadow like the middle tones of a rembrandt and the professor good man talking wonderfully of everything under the stars and over them while oliver saffron and i sat under the spell of the big kind voice the young man listening with the same eagerness which marked him when he spoke it was an eagerness to understand not to interrupt these were our evenings in the afternoons the two went for their walk as usual though now they did not plunge out of sight of the main road with the noticeable haste which amity had described as time pressed i perceived the caution of keredec visibly slackening whatever he had feared the obscurity and continued quiet of les trois pigeons reassured him he felt more and more secure in this sheltered retreat far out of the world and obviously thought no danger imminent so the days went by uneventful for my new friends days of warm idleness for me let them go unnarrated we passed to the event my ankle had taken its wonted time to recover i was on my feet again and into the woods not traversing on the way a certain poppy-sprinkled field whence a fine norman stallion snorted ridicule over a wall but the fortune of keredec was to sink as i rose the summer rheumatism returned came to grips with him laid him low we hobbled together for a day or so then i threw away my stick and he exchanged his for an improvised crutch by the time i was fit to run he was able to do little better than to creep might well have taken to his bed but as he insisted that his pupil should not forego the daily long walks and the health of the forest it came to pass that saffron often made me the objective of his rambles at dinner he usually asked in what portion of the forest i should be painting late the next afternoon and i got in the habit of expecting him to join me toward sunset we located each other through a code of yodeling that we arranged his part of these vocal gymnastics being very pleasant to hear for he had a flexible rich voice i shudder to recall how largely my own performances partook of the grotesque but in the forest where were no musical persons i supposed to take hurt from whatever noise i made i would let go with all the lungs i had he followed the horrid sounds to their origin and we would return to the inn together on these homeward walks i found him a good companion and that is something not to be undervalued by a selfish man who lives for himself and his own little ways and his own little thoughts and for very little else which is the kind of man as i have already confessed that i was deserving the pity of all happily or unhappily married persons responsive in kind to either a talkative mood or a silent one always gentle in manner and always unobtrusively melancholy saffron never took the initiative though now and then he asked a question about some rather simple matter which might be puzzling him whatever the answer he usually received it in silence apparently turning the thing over and over and inside out in his mind he was almost tremulously sensitive yet not vain for he was neither afraid nor ashamed to expose his ignorance his amazing lack of experience he had a greater trouble one that i had not fathomed sometimes there came over his face a look of importunate wistfulness and distressed perplexity and he seemed on the point of breaking out with something that he wished to tell me or to ask me for it might have been a question but he always kept it back keredec's training seldom lost its hold upon him i had gone back to my glade again and to the thin sunshine which came a little earlier now that we were deep in july and one afternoon i sat in the mouth of the path just where i had played the bounding harlequin for the benefit of the lovely visitor at quesnay it was warm in the woods and quiet 
warm with the heat of july still with the july stillness the leaves had no motion if there were birds or insects within hearing they must have been asleep the quivering flight of a butterfly in that languid air seemed by contrast quite a commotion a hummingbird would have made a riot i heard the light snapping of a twig and a swish of branches from the direction in which i faced evidently someone was approaching the glade though concealed from me for the moment by the winding of the path taking it for saffron as a matter of course for we had arranged to meet at that time and place i raised my voice in what i intended for a merry yodel of greeting i yodeled loud i yodeled long knowing my own deficiencies in this art i had adopted the cunning sinner's policy toward sin and made a joke of it thus since my best performance was not unsuggestive of calamity in the poultry yard i made it worse and then and there when my mouth was at its widest in the production of these shocking ola hootings the person approaching came round a turn in the path and within full sight of me to my ultimate utmost horror it was madame d'armand i grew so furiously red that it burned me i had not the courage to run though i could have prayed that she might take me for what i seemed plainly a lunatic whooping the lonely peace of the woods into pandemonium and turn back but she kept straight on must inevitably reach the glade and cross it and i calculated wretchedly that at the rate she was walking unhurried but not lagging it would be about thirty seconds before she passed me then suddenly while i waited in sizzling shame a clear voice rang out from a distance in an answering yodel to mine and i thanked heaven for its mercies at least she would see that my antics had some reason she stopped short in a half step as if a little startled one arm raised to push away a thin green branch that crossed the path at shoulder height and her attitude was so charming as she paused detained to listen by this other voice with its musical youthfulness that for a second i thought crossly of all the young men in the world there was a final call clear and loud as a bugle and she turned to the direction whence it came so that her back was toward me then oliver saffron came running lightly round the turn of the path near her and facing her he stopped as short as she had her hand dropped from the slender branch and pressed against her side he lifted his hat and spoke to her and i thought she made some quick reply in a low voice though i could not be sure she held that startled attitude a moment longer then turned and crossed the glade so hurriedly that it was almost as if she ran away from him i had moved aside with my easel and camp-stool but she passed close to me as she entered the path again on my side of the glade she did not seem to see me her dark eyes stared widely straight ahead her lips were parted and she looked white and frightened she disappeared very quickly in the windings of the path End of chapter eight Chapter Nine of The Guest of Quesme by Booth Tarkington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Nine. He came on more slowly, his eyes following her as she vanished. Then, turning to me with a rather pitiful apprehension, a look like that I remember to have seen some hundreds of years ago on the face of a freshman glancing up from his book to find his doorway ominously filling with sophomores i stepped out to meet him indignant upon several counts most of all upon his own i knew there was no offence in his heart not the remotest rude intent but the fact was before me that he had frightened a woman had given this very lovely guest of my friends good cause to hold him a bore if she did not indeed thank him as she probably thought me an outright lunatic i said you spoke to that lady and my voice sounded unexpectedly harsh and sharp to my own ears for i had meant to speak quietly i know i know it it was wrong he stammered i knew i shouldn't and i couldn't help it you expect me to believe that it's the truth i couldn't 
i laughed sceptically and he flinched but repeated that what he had said was only the truth i don't understand it was all beyond me he added huskily what was it you said to her i spoke her name madame d'armand you said more than that i asked her if she would let me see her again what else nothing he answered humbly and then she then for a moment it seemed for a moment she didn't seem to be able to speak i should think not i shouted and burst out at him with satirical laughter he stood patiently enduring it his lowered eyes following the aimless movements of his hands which were twisting and untwisting his flexible straw hat and it might have struck me as near akin to tragedy rather than to a thing for laughter the spectacle of a grown man so like a schoolboy before the master shamefaced over a stammered confession but she did say something to you didn't she i asked finally with the gentleness of a cross-examining lawyer yes after that moment well what was it she said not now that was all i suppose that was all she had breath for it was just the inconsequent and meaningless thing a frightened woman would say meaningless he repeated and looked up wonderingly did you take it for an appointment i roared quite out of patience and losing my temper completely no 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 she said only that and then then she turned and ran away from you mm, yes he said swallowing painfully that pleased you i stormed to frighten a woman in the woods to make her feel that she can't walk here in safety you enjoy doing things like that he looked at me with disconcerting steadiness for a moment and without offering any other response turned aside resting his arm against the trunk of a tree and gazing into the quiet forest i set about packing my traps grumbling various sarcasms the last mutterings of a departed storm for already i realized that i had taken out my own mortification upon him and i was stricken with remorse and yet so contrarily are we made i continue to be unkind while in my heart i was asking pardon of him i tried to make my reproaches gentler to lend my voice a hint of friendly humour but in spite of me the one sounded gruffer and the other sourer with everything i said this was the worst because of the continued silence of the victim he did not once answer nor by the slightest movement alter his attitude until i had finished and more than finished there and that's all i said desperately when the things were strapped and i had slung them to my shoulder let's be off in heaven's name at that he turned quickly toward me it did not lessen my remorse to see that he had grown very pale i wouldn't have frightened her for the world he said and his voice and his whole body shook with a strange violence i, I wouldn't have frightened her to please the angels in heaven a blunderer whose incantation had brought the spirit up to face me i stared at him helplessly nor could i find words to answer or control the passion that my imbecile scolding had evoked whatever the barriers keredec's training had built for his protection they were down now you think i told a lie he cried you think i lied when i said i couldn't help speaking to her no no i said earnestly i didn't mean words he swept the feeble protest away drowned in a whirling vehemence and what does it matter you can't understand when you want to know what to do you look back into your life and it tells you and i look back ah he cried out uttering a half-choked incoherent syllable i look back and it's all blind all these things you can do and can't do all these infinite little things you know and keredec knows and glukwok knows and every mortal soul on earth knows but i don't know your life has taught you and you know but i don't know i haven't had my life it's gone all i have is words that keredec has said to me and it's like a man with no eyes out in the sunshine hunting for the light do you think words can teach you to resist such impulses as i had when i spoke to madame d'armand 
can life itself teach you to resist them perhaps you never had them i don't know i answered honestly i would burn my hand for my arm and my arm for my body he went on with the same wild intensity rather than trouble her or frighten her but i couldn't help speaking to her any more than i can help wanting to see her again the feeling that i must whatever you say or do whatever keredec says or does whatever the whole world may say or do and i will it isn't a thing to choose to do or not to do i can't help it any more than i can help being alive he paused wiping from his brow a heavy dew not of the heat but like that on the forehead of a man in crucial pain i made nervous haste to seize the opportunity and said gently almost timidly but if it should distress the lady yes then i could keep away but i must know that i think you might know it by her running away and by her look i said mildly didn't you no and his eyes flashed with an added emphasis well well i said let's be on our way or the professor will be wondering if he is to dine alone without looking to see if he followed i struck into the path toward home he did follow obediently enough not uttering another word so long as we were in the woods though i could hear him breathing sharply as he strode behind me and knew that he was struggling to regain control of himself i set the pace making it as fast as i could and neither of us spoke again until we had come out of the forest and were upon the main road near the Baltry cottage then he said in a steadier voice why should it distress her well you see i began not slackening the pace there are formalities ah i know he interrupted with an impatient laugh keredec once took me to a marionette show all the little people strung on wires they couldn't move any other way and so you mustn't talk to a woman until somebody whose name has been spoken to you speaks yours to her do you call that a rule of nature my dear boy i laughed in some desperation we must conform to it ordinarily no matter whose rule it is do you think madame d'armand cares for little forms like that he asked challengingly she does i assured him with perfect confidence and for the hundredth time you must have seen how you troubled her no he returned with the same curious obstinacy i don't believe it there was something but it wasn't trouble we looked straight at each other i saw her eyes plainly and it was he paused and sighed a sudden brilliant smile upon his lips it was very strange there was something so glad and different in his look that like any other dried-up old blunderer in, in my place i felt an instant tendency to laugh it was that heathenish possession the old insanity of the risibles which makes a man think it a humorous thing that his friend should be discovered in love but before i spoke before i quite smiled outright i was given the grace to see myself in the likeness of a leering stranger trespassing in some cherished enclosure a garden where the gentlest guests must always be intruders and only the owner should come the best of us profane it readily leaving the coarse prints of our heels upon its paths mauling and manhandling the fairy blossoms with what pudgy fingers comes the poet ruthlessly leaping the wall and trumpeting indecently his view hallo of the chase and after him the joker snickering and hopeful of a kill among the rose-beds for this has been their hunting-ground since the world began these two have made us miserably ashamed of the divine infinitive so that we are afraid to utter the very words to love lest some urchin overhear and pursue us with a sticky forefinger and stickier taunts it is little to my credit that i checked the silly impulse to giggle at the eternal marvel and went as gently as i could where i should not have gone at all but if you were wrong i said if it did distress her and if it happened that she has already had too much that was distressing in her life you know something about her he exclaimed you know i do not i interrupted in turn i have only a vague guess i may be altogether mistaken what is it that you guess 
he demanded abruptly who made her suffer i think it was her husband i said with a lack of discretion for which i was instantly sorry bearing with reason that i had added a final blunder to the long list of the afternoon that is i added if my guess is right he stopped short in the road detaining me by the arm the question coming like a whip crack sharp loud violent is he alive i don't know i answered beginning to move forward and this is foolish talk especially on my part but i want to know he persisted again detaining me and i don't know i returned emphatically probably i am entirely mistaken in thinking that i know anything of her whatever i ought not to have spoken unless i knew what i was talking about and i'd rather not say any more until i do know very well he said quickly will you tell me then yes if you will let it go at that thank you he said and with an impulse which was but too plainly one of gratitude offered me his hand i took it and my soul was disquieted within me for it was no purpose of mine to set inquiries on foot in regard to the affairs of madame d'armand it was early dusk that hour a little silver but still clear when the edges of things are beginning to grow indefinite and usually our sleepy countryside knew no tranquiller time of day but to-night as we approached the inn there were strange shapes in the roadway and other tokens that events were stirring there from the courtyard came the sounds of laughter and chattering voices before the entrance stood a couple of open touring cars the chauffeurs engaged in cooling the rear tires with buckets of water brought by a personage ordinarily known as Glouglo, whose look and manner as he performed this office for the leathern dignitaries so awed me that i wondered i had ever dared address him with any presumption of intimacy the cars were great and opulent of impressive wheelbase and fore and aft they were laden intricately with baggage concave trunks fitting behind the tonneaus thin trunks fastened upon the footboards green circular trunks adjusted to the spare tires all deeply coated with dust here were fineries from paris doubtless on their way to flutter over the gayest sands of trouville and now wandering but temporarily from the road for such splinters were never designed to dazzle us of madame brossard's we were crossing before the machines when one of the drivers saw fit to crank his engine if that is the knowing phrase and the thing shook out the usual vibrating uproar it had a devastating effect upon my companion he uttered a wild exclamation and sprang sideways into me almost upsetting us both what on earth is the matter i asked did you think the car was starting he turned toward me a face upon which was imprinted the sheer blank terror of a child it passed in an instant however and he laughed i really didn't know everything has been so quiet always out here in the country and that horrible racket coming so suddenly laughing with him i took his arm and we turned to enter the archway as we did so we almost ran into a tall man who was coming out evidently intending to speak to one of the drivers the stranger stepped back with a word of apology and i took note of him for a fellow-countryman and a worldly buck of fashion indeed almost as cap a pie the automobilist as my mysterious spiller of cider had been the pedestrian but this was no game chicken on the contrary so far as a glance in the dusk of the archway revealed him so much the picture for framing in a club window of a sunday morning a seasoned hard-surfaced knowing creature for whom many a head waiter must have swept previous claimants from desired tables he looked forty years so candidly that i guessed him to be about fifty we were passing him when he uttered an ejaculation of surprise and stepped forward again holding out his hand to my companion and exclaiming where did you come from i'd hardly have known you oliver seemed unconscious of the proffered hand he stiffened visibly and said i think there must be some mistake so there is said the other promptly i have been misled by a resemblance i beg your pardon he lifted his cap slightly 
going on and we entered the courtyard to find a cheerful party of nine or ten men and women seated about a couple of tables like the person we had just encountered they all exhibited a picturesque elaboration of the costume permitted by their mode of travel making effective groupings in their ample draperies of buff and green and white with glimpses of a flushed and pretty face or two among the loosened veilings upon the tables were pots of tea plates of sandwiches madame brossard's three best silver dishes heaped with fruit and some bottles of dry champagne from the cellars of rain the partakers were making very merry having with them as is inevitable in all such parties it seems a fat young man inclined to humour who was now upon his feet for the proposal of some prankish toast he interrupted himself long enough to glance our way as we crossed the garden and it struck me that several pairs of brighter eyes followed my young companion with interest he was well worth it perhaps all the more because he was so genuinely unconscious of it and he ran up the gallery steps and disappeared into his own rooms without sending even a glance from the corner of his eye in return i went almost as quickly to my pavilion and without lighting my lamp set about my preparations for dinner the party outside breaking up presently could be heard moving toward the archway with increased noise and laughter inspired by some exquisite antic on the part of the fat young man when a girl's voice a very attractive voice called oh cressy aren't you coming and a man's replied from near my veranda only stopping to light a cigar a flutter of skirts and a patter of feet betokened that the girl came running back to join the smoker cressy i heard her say in an eager lowered tone who was he who was who that devastating creature in white flannels the man chuckled matinee sort of devastator what monte cristo hair noble profile you'd better tell me she interrupted earnestly if you don't want me to ask the waiter but i don't know him i saw you speak to him i thought it was a man i met three years ago out in san francisco but i was mistaken there was a slight resemblance this fellow might have been a rather decent younger brother of the man i knew he was the my strong impression was that if the speaker had not been interrupted at this point he would have said something very unfavorable to the character of the man he had met in san francisco but there came a series of blasts from the automobile horns and loud calls from others of the party who were evidently waiting for these two coming shouted the man wait said his companion hurriedly who was the other man the older one with the painting things and such a coat never saw him before in my life i caught a last word from the girl as the pair moved away i'll come back here with a band to-morrow night and serenade the beautiful one perhaps he dropped me his card out of the window the horns sounded again there was a final chorus of laughter suddenly ceasing to be heard as the car swept away and les trois pigeons was left to its accustomed quiet monsieur is served said amadie looking in at my door five minutes later you have passed a great hour just now amadie it was like the old days truly they are off for Tuvi, i suppose no monsieur they are on their way to visit the chateau and stopped here only because the run from paris had made the tires too hot to visit quesnay you mean truly but monsieur need give himself no uneasiness i did not mention to any one that monsieur is here his name was not spoken mademoiselle ward returned to the chateau to-day he added she has been in england quesnay will be gay i said coming out to the table oliver saffron was helping the professor down the steps and keredec bent with suffering but indomitable gave me a hearty greeting and began a ruthless dissection of plato with the soup oliver usually very quiet as i have said seemed a little restless under the discourse to-night however he did not interrupt sitting patiently until bedtime though obviously not listening when he bade me good-night he gave me a look so clearly in reference to a secret understanding between us that meaning to keep only the letter of my promise to him 
i felt about as comfortable as i had meanly tricked a child End of chapter nine chapter ten of the guest of quesnay by booth tarkington this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox dot org reading by matt perard chapter ten i had finished dressing next morning and was strapping my things together for the day's campaign when i heard a shuffling step upon the porch and the door opened gently without any previous ceremony of knocking to my angle of vision what at first appeared to have opened it was a tray of coffee rolls eggs and a packet of sandwiches but after hesitating somewhat this apparition advanced farther into the room disclosing a pair of supporting hands followed in due time by the whole person of a nervously smiling and visibly apprehensive amadie he closed the door behind him by the simple action of backing against it took the cloth from his arm and with a single gesture spread it neatly upon a small table then turning to me laid the forefinger of his right hand warningly upon his lips and bowed me a deferential invitation to occupy the chair beside the table well i said glaring at him what ails you i thought monsieur might prefer his breakfast indoors this morning he returned in a low voice why should i the miserable old man said something i did not understand an incoherent syllable or two suddenly covered his mouth with both hands and turned away i heard a catch in his throat suffocated sounds issued from his bosom however it was nothing more than a momentary seizure and recovering command of himself by a powerful effort he faced me with hypocritical servility why do you laugh i asked indignantly but i did not laugh he replied in a husky whisper not at all you did i asserted raising my voice it almost killed you monsieur he begged hoarsely hush what is the matter i demanded loudly what do you mean by these abominable croakings speak out monsieur he gesticulated in a panic toward the courtyard mademoiselle ward is out there what but i did not shout the word there is always a little window in the rear wall he breathed in my ear as i dropped into the chair by the table she would not see you if i interrupted with all the french rough and ready expressions of dislike at my command daring to hope that they might give him some shadowy far-away idea of what i thought of both himself and his suggestions and notwithstanding the difficulty of expressing strong feeling in whispers it seemed to me that in a measure i succeeded i am not in the habit of crawling out of ventilators i added subduing a tendency to vehemence and probably mademoiselle ward has only come to talk with madame brossard i fear some of those people may have told her you were here he ventured insinuatingly what people i asked drinking my coffee calmly yet it must be confessed without quite the deliberation i could have wished those who stopped yesterday evening on the way to the chateau they might have recognized impossible i knew none of them but mademoiselle ward knows that you are here without doubt why do you say so because she has inquired for you so i rose at once and went toward the door why didn't you tell me at once but surely he remonstrated ignoring my question monsieur will make some change of attire change of attire i echoed eh, the poor old coat all hunched at the shoulders and spotted with paint why shouldn't it be i hissed thoroughly irritated do you take me for a racing marquis but monsieur has a coat much more as a coat ought to be and jean ferret says ha now we're getting at it said i what does jean ferret say perhaps it would be better if i did not repeat out with it what does jean ferret say well then mademoiselle ward's maid from paris has told jean ferret that monsieur and mademoiselle ward have corresponded for years and that 
and that go on i bade him ominously that monsieur has sent mademoiselle ward many expensive jewels and aha said i at which he paused abruptly and stood staring at me the idea of explaining miss elizabeth's collection to him of getting anything whatever through that complacent head of his was so hopeless that i did not even consider it there was only one thing to do and perhaps i should have done it i do not know for he saw the menace coiling in my eye and hurriedly retreated monsieur he gasped backing away from me and as his hand fumbling behind him found the latch of the door he opened it and scrambled out by a sort of spiral movement round the casing when i followed a moment later with my traps on my shoulder and the packet of sandwiches in my pocket he was out of sight miss elizabeth sat beneath the arbor at the other end of the courtyard and beside her stood the trim and glossy bay saddle horse that she had ridden from quesnay his head outstretched above his mistress to paddle at the vine leaves with a tremulous upper lip she checked his desire with a slight movement of her hand upon the bridle rein and he arched his neck prettily pawing the gravel with a neat forefoot miss elizabeth is one of the few large women i have known to whom a riding habit is entirely becoming and this group of two a handsome woman and her handsome horse has had a charm for all men ever since horses were tamed and women began to be beautiful i thought of my work of the canvases i meant to cover but i felt the charm and i felt it stirringly it was a fine fresh morning and the sun just risen an expression in the lady's attitude and air which i instinctively construed as histrionic seemed intended to convey that she had been kept waiting yet had waited without reproach and although she must have heard me coming she did not look toward me until i was quite near and spoke her name at that she sprang up quickly enough and stretched out her hand to me run to earth she cried advancing a step to meet me a pretty poor trophy of the chase said i but proud that you are its killer to my surprise and mystification her cheese and brow flushed rosily she was obviously conscious of it and laughed don't be embarrassed she said i yes you poor man i supposed i could not have more thoroughly compromised you madame brossard will never believe in your respectability again oh yes she will said i what a lodger who has ladies calling upon him at five o'clock in the morning but your bundle's on your shoulder she rattled on laughing though there's many could be bolder and perhaps you'll let me walk a bit of the way with you if you're for the road perhaps i will said i she caught up her riding skirt fastening it by a clasp at her side and we passed out through the archway and went slowly along the road bordering the forest her horse following obediently at half rein's length when did you hear that i was at madame brossard's i asked ten minutes after i returned to quesnay late yesterday afternoon who told you louise i repeated the name questioningly you mean mrs larrabee harman louise harman she corrected didn't you know she was staying at quesnay i guessed it though amedy got the name confused yes she's been kind enough to look after the place for us while we were away george won't be back for another ten days and i've been overseeing an exhibition for him in london afterward i did a round of visits tiresome enough but among people it's well to keep in touch with on george's account i see i said with a grimness which probably escaped her but how did mrs harman know that i was at les trois pigeons she met you once in the forest twice i interrupted she mentioned only once of course she'd often heard both george and me speak of you but how did she know it was i and where i was staying oh that her smile changed to a laugh your maitre de hotel told ferre a gardener at quesnay that you were at the inn he did oh but you mustn't be angry with him he made it quite all right how did he do that i asked trying to speak calmly though there was that in my mind which might have blanched the parchment cheek of a grand inquisitor he told ferret that you were very anxious not to have it known 
you call that making it all right for himself i mean he asked for ray not to mention who it was that told him the rascal i cried the treacherous brazen unfortunate man said miss elizabeth don't you see how clear you're making it that you really meant to hide from us there seemed to be something in that and my tirade broke up in confusion oh no i said lamely i hoped i hoped be careful no i hoped to work down there i blurted and i thought if i saw too much of you i might not she looked at me with widening eyes and i can take my choice she cried of all the different things you may mean by that it's either the most outrageous speech i ever heard or the most flattering but i meant simply no she lifted her hand and stopped me i'd rather believe that i have at least the choice and let it go at that and as i began to laugh she turned to me with a gravity apparently so genuine that for the moment i was fatuous enough to believe that she had said it seriously ensued a pause of some duration which for my part i found disturbing she broke it with a change of subject you think louise very lovely to look at don't you exquisite i answered everyone does i suppose she told you and now i felt myself growing red that i behaved like a drunken acrobat when she came upon me in the path no did you cried miss elizabeth with a ready credulity which i thought by no means pretty indeed she seemed amused and to my surprise for she is not an unkind woman rather heartlessly pleased louise only said she knew it must be you and that she wished she could have had a better look at what you were painting heaven bless her i exclaimed her reticence was angelic yes she has reticence said my companion with enough of the same quality to make me look at her quickly a thin line had been drawn across her forehead you mean she's still reticent with george i ventured yes she answered sadly poor george always hopes of course in the silent way of his kind when they suffer from such unfortunate passions and he waits i suppose that former husband of hers recovered i believe he's still alive somewhere locked up i hope she finished crisply she retained his name i observed harmon yes she retained it said my companion rather shortly at all events she's rid of him isn't she oh she's rid of him her tone implied an enigmatic reservation of some kind it's hard i reflected aloud hard to understand her making that mistake young as she was even in the glimpses of her i've had it was easy to see something of what she's like a fine rare high type but you didn't know him did you miss elizabeth asked with some dryness no i answered i saw him twice once at the time of his accident that was only a nightmare his face covered with i shivered but i had caught a glimpse of him on the boulevard and of all the dreadful oh but he wasn't always dreadful she interposed quickly he was a fascinating sort of person quite charming and good-looking when she ran away with him though he was horribly dissipated even then he always had been that of course she thought she'd be able to straighten him out poor girl she tried for three years three years it hurts one to think of you see it must have been something very like a grand passion to hold her through a pain three years long for tremendous pride said i women make an odd world of it for the rest of us there was good old george as true and straight a man as ever lived and she took the other yes george's sister laughed sorrowfully but george and she have both survived the mistake i went on with confidence her tragedy must have taught her some important differences haven't you a notion she'll be tremendously glad to see him when he comes back from america ah i do hope so she cried you see i'm fearing that he hopes so too to the degree i'm counting on it you don't count it on yourself she shook her head with any other woman i should why not with mrs harmon cousin louise has her ways 
said miss elizabeth slowly and whether she could not further explain her doubts or whether she would not that was all i got out of her on the subject at the time i asked one or two more questions but my companion merely shook her head again alluding vaguely to her cousin's ways then she brightened suddenly and inquired when i would have my things sent up to the chateau from the inn at the risk of a misunderstanding which i felt i could ill afford i resisted her kind hospitality and the outcome of it was that there should be a kind of armistice to begin with my dining at the chateau that evening thereupon she mounted to the saddle a bit of gymnastics for which she declined my assistance and looked down upon me from a great height did anybody ever tell you was her surprising inquiry that you are the queerest man of these times no i answered don't you think you're a queerer woman Fotal, she cried scornfully be off to your woods and your woodscaping the bay horse departed as a smart gait not i was glad to see a parkish trot miss elizabeth wisely set limits to her sacrifices to mode and she was far down the road before i had passed the outer fringe of trees my work was accomplished after a fashion more or less desultory that day i had many absent moments was restless and walked more than i painted oliver saffron did not join me in the late afternoon nor did the echo of distant yodeling bespeak any effort on his part to find me so i gave him up and returned to the inn earlier than usual while dressing i sent word to professor keredec that i should not be able to join him at dinner that evening and it is to be recorded that glouglou carried the message for me amedee did not appear from which it may be inferred that our maitre d'hôtel was subject to lucid intervals certainly his present shyness indicated an intelligence of no low order End of chapter ten chapter eleven of the guest of quesnay by booth tarkington this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt perard chapter eleven the dining-room at quesnay is a pretty work of the second of those three lewises who made so much furniture it was never a proper setting for a rusty out-of-doors painter-man nor has such a fellow ever found himself complacently at ease there since the day its first banquet was spread for a score or so of fine-feathered epigram jinglers fiddling versailles gossip out of a rouge and lace quesnay marquis newly sent into half-earnest banishment for too much king-hunting for my part however i should have preferred a chance at making a place for myself among the wigs and brocades to the crusoe's isle of my chair at miss elizabeth's table i learned at an early age to look my vanities in the face i outfaced them and they quailed but persisted surviving for my discomfort to this day here is the confession it was not until my arrival at the chateau that i realized what temerity it involved to dine there in evening clothes purchased some four or five or six years previously in the economical neighborhood of the boulevard saint michel yet the things fitted me well enough were clean and not shiny having been worn no more than a dozen times i think though they might have been better pressed looking over the men of the quesnay party or perhaps i should signify a reversal of that and say a glance of theirs at me revealed the importance of a particular length of coat-tail of a certain rich effect obtained by widely separating the lower points of the waistcoat or the display of some imagination in the buttons upon the same garment of a double-backed arrangement of cuffs and of a specific design and dimension of tie marked uniformity in these matters denoted their necessity and clothes differing from the essential so vitally as did mine must have seemed immodest little better than no clothes at all i doubt if i could have argued in extenuation my lack of advantages for study such an excuse being itself the damning circumstance 
of course eccentricity is permitted but as in the arts only to the established and i recall a painful change of colour which befell the countenance of a shining young man i met at ward's house in paris he had used his handkerchief and was absently putting it in his pocket when he providentially noticed what he was doing and restored it to his sleeve miss elizabeth had the courage to take me under her wing placing me upon her left at dinner but sprightlier calls than mine demanded and occupied her attention at my other side sat a magnificently upholstered lady who offered a fine shoulder and the rear wall of a collar of pearls for my observation throughout the evening as she leaned forward talking eagerly with a male personage across the table this was a prince ending in ski he permitted himself the slight vagary of wearing a gold bracelet and perhaps this flavour of romance drew the lady had my good fortune ever granted a second meeting i should not have known her fragments reaching me in my seclusion indicated that the various conversations up and down the long table were animated and at times some topic proved of such high interest as to engage the comment of the whole company this was the case when the age of one of the english king's grandchildren came in question but a subject which called for even longer if less spirited discourse concerned the shameful lack of standard on the part of citizens of the united states or as it was put with no little exasperation what is the trouble with america hereupon brightly gleamed the fat young man whom i had marked for a wit at l'etoile pigeon he pictured with inimitable mimicry a western senator lately in france this outcast it appeared had worn a slouch hat at a garden party and had otherwise betrayed his country to the ridicule of the intelligent but really said the fat young man turning plaintive in conclusion imagine what such things make the english and the french think of us and it finally went by consent that the trouble with america was the vulgarity of our tourists a dreadful lot miss elizabeth cheerfully summed up for them all the miseries i undergo with that class of prominent americans who bring letters to my brother i remember one awful creature who said when i came into the room well ma'am i guess you're the lady of the house aren't you miss elizabeth sparkled through the chorus of laughter but i remembered the awful creature a genial and wise old man of affairs whose daughter's portrait george painted miss elizabeth had missed his point the canvasser's phrase had been intended with humour and even had it lacked that it was not without a pretty quaintness so i thought being left to my own reflections which may have partaken of my own special kind of snobbery at least i regretted the elizabeth of the morning garden and the early walk along the fringe of the woods for she at my side to-night was another lady the banquet was drawing to a close when she leaned toward me and spoke in an undertone as this was the first sign in so protracted a period that i might ever again establish relations with the world of men it came upon me like a friday's footprint and in the moment of shock i did not catch what she said anne elliot yonder is asking you a question she repeated nodding at a very pretty gal down and across the table from me miss anne elliot's attractive voice had previously enabled me to recognize her as the young woman who had threatened to serenade les trois pigeons i beg your pardon i said addressing her and at the sound my obscurity was illuminated about half of the company turning to look at me with wide-eyed surprise i spoke in an ordinary tone it may need to be explained and there is nothing remarkable about my voice i hear you at les trois pigeons said miss elliot yes would you mind telling us something of the mysterious narcissus if you'll be more definite i returned in the tone of a question there couldn't be more than one like that said miss elliot at least not in one neighbourhood could there i mean a recklessly charming vision with a white tie and white hair and white flannels 
oh said i he's not mysterious but he is she returned i insist on his being mysterious rarely grandly strangely mysterious you will let me think so this young lady had a whimsical manner of emphasizing words unexpectedly with a breathless intensity that approached to violence a habit dangerously contagious among nervous persons so that i answered slowly out of a fear that i might echo it it would need a great deal of imagination he's a young american very attractive very simple but he's mad she interrupted oh no i said hastily but he is a person told me so in a garden this very afternoon she went on eagerly a person with a rake and ever so many moles on his chin this person told me all about him his name is oliver saffron and he's in the charge of a very large doctor and quite quite mad jean ferre the gardener i said deliberately and with venom is fast acquiring notoriety in these parts as an idiot of purest ray and he had his information from another whose continuance unhanged is every hour more miraculous how ruthless of you cried miss elliot with exaggerated reproach when i have had such a thrilling happiness all day in believing that riotously beautiful creature mad you are wholly positive he isn't our dialogue was now all that delayed a general departure from the table this combined with the naive surprise i have mentioned served to make us temporarily the centre of attention and among the faces turned toward me my glance fell unexpectedly upon one i had not seen since entering the dining-room mrs harman had been placed at some distance from me and on the same side of the table but now she leaned far back in her chair to look at me so that i saw her behind the shoulders of the people between us she was watching me with an expression unmistakably of repressed anxiety and excitement and as our eyes met hers shone with a certain agitation as of some odd consciousness shared with me it was so strangely suddenly a reminder of the look of secret understanding given me with good night twenty-four hours earlier by the man whose sanity was miss elliot's topic that puzzled and almost disconcerted for the moment i did not at once reply to the lively young lady's question you're hesitating she cried clasping her hands i believe there's a darling little chance of it after all and if it weren't so why would he need to be watched over day and night by an enormous doctor this is romance i retorted the doctor is professor keredec illustriously known in this country but not as a physician and they are following some form of scientific research together i believe but assuming to speak as mr saffron's friend i added rising with the others upon miss ward's example i'm sure if he could come to know of your interest he would much rather play hamlet for you than let you find him disappointing if he could come to know of my interest she echoed glancing down at herself with mock demureness don't you think he could come to know something more of me than that the windows had been thrown open allowing passage to a veranda miss elizabeth led the way outdoors with the prince the rest of us following at hazard and in the mild confusion of this withdrawal i caught a final glimpse of mrs harman which revealed that she was still looking at me with the same tensity but with the movement of intervening groups i lost her miss elliot pointedly waited for me until i came round the table attached me definitely by taking my arm accompanying her action with a dazzling smile oh do you think you can manage it she whispered rapturously to which i replied as vaguely as i could that the demands of scientific research upon the time of its followers were apt to be exorbitant tables and coffee were waiting on the broad terrace below with a big moon rising in the sky i descended the steps in charge of this pretty cavalier allowed her to seat me at the most remote of the tables 
and accepted without unwillingness other gallantries of hers in the matter of coffee and cigarettes and now she said now that i've done so much for your dearest hopes and comfort look up at the milky moon and tell me all if you can bear it she leaned an elbow on the marble railing that protected the terrace and shielding her eyes from the moonlight with her hand affected to gaze at me dramatically have no distrust she bade me who and what is the glorious stranger resisting an impulse to chime in with her humour i gave her so dry and commonplace an account of my young friend at the inn that i presently found myself abandoned to solitude again i don't know where to go she complained as she rose these other people are most painful to a girl of my intelligence but i cannot linger by your side untruth long ago lost its interest for me and i prefer to believe mr jean ferret if that is the gentleman's name i'd join miss ward and cressy ingle yonder but cressy would be indignant i shall soothe my heart with sweetest airs adieu with that she made me a solemn courtesy and departed a pretty little figure not little in attractiveness the strong moonlight tinged with blue shimmering over her blonde hair and splashing brightly among the ripples of her silks and laces she swept across the terrace languidly offering an effect of comedy not unfairy-like and ascending the steps of the veranda disappeared into the orange candlelight of a salon a moment later some chords were sounded firmly upon a piano in that room and a bitter song swam out to me over the laughter and talk of the people at the other tables it was to be observed that miss anne elliot sang very well though i thought she overemphasized one line of the stanza this world is a world of lies perhaps she had poisoned another little arrow for me too impelled by the fine night the groups upon the terrace were tending toward a wider dispersal drifting over the sloping lawns by threes and couples and i was able to identify two figures threading the paths of the garden together some distance below judging by the pace they kept i should have concluded that miss ward and mr cresson ingle sought the healthful effects of exercise however i could see no good reason for wishing their conversation less obviously absorbing though miss elliot's insinuation that mr ingle might deplore intrusion upon the interview had struck me as too definite to be altogether pleasing still such matters could not discontent me with my solitude eastward over the moonlit roof of the forest i could see the quiet ocean its unending lines of foam moving slowly to the long beaches too far away to be heard the reproachful voice of the singer came no more from the house but the piano ran on into la vie de bois and out of that into something else i did not know what but it seemed to be music at least it was musical enough to bring before me some memory of the faces of pretty girls i had danced with long ago in my dancing days so that what with the music and the distant sea and the soft air so sparklingly full of moonshine and the little dancing memories i was floated off into a reverie that was like a prelude for the person who broke it she came so quietly that i did not hear her until she was almost beside me and spoke to me it was the second time that had happened End of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of The Guest of Quesnay by Booth Tarkington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Twelve. Mrs. Harmon, I said, as she took the chair vacated by the elfin young lady. You see, I can manage it, but perhaps I control myself better when there's no camp-stool to inspire me you remember my woodland didos i fear she smiled in a pleasant comprehending way but neither directly replied nor made any return speech whatever instead she let her forearms rest on the broad railing of the marble balustrade and leaning forward gazed out over the shining and mysterious slopes below 
somehow it seemed to me that her not answering and her quiet action as well as the thoughtful attitude in which it culminated would have been thought very like her by any one who knew her well cousin louise has her ways miss elizabeth had told me this was probably one of them and i found it singularly attractive for that matter from the day of my first sight of her in the woods i had needed no prophet to tell me i should like mrs harmon's ways after the quiet you have had here all this must seem i said looking down upon the strollers a usurpation oh they she disposed of quesnay's guest with a slight movement of her left hand you're an old friend of my cousins of both of them but even without that i know you understand elizabeth does it all for her brother of course but she likes it i said and mr ward likes it too she added slowly you'll see when he comes home night's effect upon me being always to make me venturesome i took a chance and ventured perhaps too far i hope we'll see many happy things when he comes home it's her doing things of this sort she said giving no sign of having heard my remark that has helped so much to make him the success that he is it's what has been death to his art i exclaimed too quickly and would have been glad to recall the speech she met it with a murmur of low laughter that sounded pitying wasn't it always a dubious relation between him and art and without awaiting an answer she went on so it's all the better that he can have his success to this i had nothing whatever to say so far as i remembered i had never before heard a woman put so much comprehension of a large subject in so few words but in my capacity as george's friend hopeful for his happiness it made me a little uneasy during the ensuing pause this feeling at first uppermost gave way to another not at all in sequence but irresponsible and intuitive that she had something in particular to say to me had joined me for that purpose and was awaiting the opportunity as i have made open confession my curiosity never needed the spur and there was no denying that this impression set it off on the gallop but evidently the moment had not come for her to speak she seemed content to gaze out over the valley in silence mr cresson ingle i hazarded is he an old new friend of your cousin's i think he was not above the horizon when i went to capri two years ago he wants elizabeth she returned adding quietly as you've seen and when i had verified this assumption with a monosyllable she continued he's an available but i should hate to have it happen he's hard he doesn't seem very hard toward her i murmured looking down into the garden where mr ingle just then happened to be adjusting a scarf about his hostess's shoulders he's led a detestable life said mrs harman among detestable people she spoke with sudden remarkable vigour and as if she knew the full-throated emphasis she put upon detestable gave the word the sting of a flagellation it rang with a rightful indignation that brought vividly to mind the thought of those three years in mrs harman's life which elizabeth said hurt one to think of for this was the lady who had rejected good george ward to run away with a man much deeper in all that was detestable than mr cresson ingle could ever be he seems to me much of a type with these others i said oh they keep their surfaces about the same it made me wish i had a little more surface to-night i laughed i'd have fitted better miss ward is different at different times when we are alone together she always has the air of excusing or at least explaining these people to me but this evening i've had the disquieting thought that perhaps she also explained me to them oh no said mrs Harmon, turning to me quickly didn't you see she was making up to mr ingle for this morning it came out that she'd ridden over at daylight to see you and elliot discovered it in some way and told him 
this presented an aspect of things so overwhelmingly novel that out of a confusion of ideas i was able to fasten on only one with which to continue the conversation and i said irrelevantly that miss elliot was a remarkable young woman at this my companion who had renewed her observation of the valley gave me a full clear look of earnest scrutiny which set me on the alert for i thought that now what she desired to say was coming but i was disappointed for she spoke lightly with a ripple of amusement i suppose she finished her investigations you told her all you could almost i suppose you wouldn't trust me with the reservation she asked smiling i would trust you with anything i answered seriously you didn't gratify that child she said half laughing then to my surprise her tone changed suddenly and she began again in a hurried low voice you didn't tell her and stopped there breathless and troubled letting me see that i had been right after all this was what she wanted to talk about i didn't tell her that young saffron is mad no if that is what you mean i'm glad you didn't she said slowly sinking back in her chair so that her face was in the shadow of the awning which sheltered the little table between us in the first place i wouldn't have told her even if it were true i returned and in the second it isn't true though you have some reason to think it is i added i she said why his speaking to you as he did a thing on the face of it inexcusable why did he call me madame d'armand she interposed i explained something of the mental processes of amedee and she listened till i had finished then bade me continue that's all i said blankly but with a second thought caught her meaning oh about young saffron you mean yes i know him pretty well i said without really knowing anything about him but what a stranger i believe he doesn't really know a great deal about himself of course i have a theory about him though it's vague my idea is that probably through some great illness he lost not his faculty of memory but his memories or at least most of them in regard to what he does remember professor keredec has anxiously impressed upon him some very poignant necessity for reticence what the necessity may be or the nature of the professor's anxieties i do not know but i think keredec's reasons must be good ones that's all except that there's something about the young man that draws one to him i couldn't tell you how much i like him nor how sorry i am that he offended you he didn't offend me she murmured almost whispered he didn't mean to i said warmly you understood that yes i understood i am glad i've been waiting the chance to try to explain to ask you to pardon him but there wasn't any need you mean because you understood no she interrupted gently not only that i mean because he has done it himself asked your pardon i said in complete surprise yes he's written you i cried no i saw him to-day she answered this afternoon when i went for my walk he was waiting where the paths intersect some hasty ejaculation i do not know what came from me but she lifted her hand wait she said quietly as soon as he saw me he came straight toward me oh but this won't do at all i broke out it's too bad wait she leaned forward slightly lifting her hand again he called me madame d'armand and said he must know if he had offended me you told him i told him no and it seemed to me that her voice which up to this point had been low but very steady shook upon the monosyllable he walked with me a little way perhaps it was longer trust me that it shan't happen again i exclaimed i'll see that keredec knows of this at once he will no no she interrupted quickly that is just what i want you not to do will you promise me i'll promise anything you ask me but didn't he frighten you didn't he talk wildly didn't he he didn't frighten me not as you mean he was very quiet and she broke off unexpectedly with a little pitying cry and turned to me 
lifting both hands appealingly and oh doesn't he make one sorry for him that was just it she had gone straight to the heart of his mystery his strangeness was the strange pathos that invested him the singularity of that other monsieur was solved for me at last when she had spoken she rose advanced a step and stood looking out over the valley again her skirts pressing the balustrade one of the moments in my life when i have wished to be a figure painter came then as she raised her arms the sleeves of some filmy texture falling back from them with the gesture and clasped her hands lightly behind her neck the graceful angle of her chin uplifted to the full rain of moonshine little miss elliot in the glamour of these same blue showerings had borrowed gauzy weavings of the fay and the sprite but mrs harmon tall straight delicate to fragility yet not to thinness was transfigured with a deeper meaning wearing the sadder richer colours of the tragedy that her cruel young romance had put upon her she might have posed as she stood against the marble railing and especially in that gesture of lifting her arms for a bearer of the gift at some foredestined luckless ceremony of votive offerings so it seemed at least to the eyes of a moon-dazed old painter-man she stood in profile to me there were some jasmine flowers at her breast i could see them rise and fall with more than deep breathing and i wondered what the man who had talked of her so wildly only yesterday would feel if he could know that already the thought of him had moved her i haven't had my life it's gone it was almost as if i heard his voice close at hand with all the passion of regret and protest that rang in the words when they broke from him in the forest and by some miraculous conjecture within the moment i seemed not only to hear his voice but actually to see him a figure dressed in white far below us and small with the distance standing out in the moonlight in the middle of the tree-bordered avenue leading to the chateau gates i rose and leaned over the railing there was no doubt about the reality of the figure in white though it was too far away to be identified with certainty and as i rubbed my eyes for clearer sight it turned and disappeared into the shadows of the orderly grove where i had stood one day to watch louise harman ascend the slopes of quesnay but i told myself sensibly that more than one man on the coast of normandy might be wearing white flannels that evening and turning to my companion found that she had moved some steps away from me and was gazing eastward to the sea i concluded that she had not seen the figure i have a request to make of you she said as i turned will you do it for me setting it down just as a whim if you like and letting it go at that yes i will i answered promptly i'll do anything you ask she stepped closer looked at me intently for a second bit her lip in indecision then said all in a breath don't tell mr saffron my name but i hadn't meant to i protested don't speak of me to him at all she said with the same hurried eagerness will you let me have my way could there be any question of that i replied and to my astonishment found that we had somehow impulsively taken each other's hands as upon a serious bargain struck between us End of chapter 12